we're going to start the talks and all that good stuff. But before we do, I forgot a couple things. Heidi and I forgot to include a couple things in the opening remarks. Uh, first of all, one that might be novel to some of you is we have a photography policy. Uh, some of us still like our personal privacy. And so we ask that uh, you read the uh, photography policy that's in the... Um, uh, in your program. Uh, in a nutshell, if you take a picture while you're at the conference, everybody in frame needs to have consented to the photo. If we find that you're taking pictures of people that don't consent, we're going to ask you to delete it and not do that anymore. And if you keep doing it, we're going to ask you to politely leave. So um, this also includes people that are speakers. Please don't do panos of the audience. That's not okay either. Uh, when you're upstairs and doing your own thing, you're out and about, it's a very photogenic city. Take pictures of the monuments in the rain or snow or sleet or ice or dinosaur storm or whatever the hell is about to happen. Uh, but while you're here, uh, please adhere to our photo policy. Um, uh, next, Ted has returned. Ted. <laughs> woo! Ted it takes their video for us. He enables us to stream this in real time and also have all the uh, uh, stuff available online. Ted also used to burn DVDs, and, and he would sell the DVDs here. But many people are now, you know, I made the VHS joke before. Now they're like, what's a DVD? Um, so Ted now has digital distribution. I think you're selling thumb drives at the end of the con? We think so. So, so. OK. Ted's highly confident opinion is probably. Uh, If you want to pay cash and just get the talks and not have to worry about uh, uh, Jason Scott and the Internet Archive, then you're more than welcome to just buy it from Ted. So please support Ted. Also, big thanks to Ted for coming all the way out from California yet again. And I will say this time, Ted took a plane. Whoa. Yeah, so Ted, one of my favorite Ted stories. Ted's been doing this for a long, long time. And he shows up one year, um, and, and he, he's, he's driven across the country with all his gear in the back of his car, and he's telling me about the cruise control that he has in his car. Are you coming up to tell the story? Uh, so Ted, and he's like, you want me to show it to you? And I'm like, I've never had anyone show me their cruise control before. Like, that's a neat thing. So Ted pulls out a stick, and it's a stick that's got little marks on it, where it's marked 55, 65, and 75. And he's like, I can wedge it up underneath the dashboard and put it on the accelerator. Depending on how fast I want to go, I just put it in the right little notch. And then I just go. And I'm like, Ted, I'm glad you're alive. Like, that was. <laughs> and the segue to that is that I just bought a new car that doesn't have a speedometer. He's got a car that doesn't have a speedometer, ladies and gentlemen. So. Yeah, I was going to bring the stick. Just, oh, so you knew how fast you were going. You could use this. Show the stick. Oh, yeah, no, that would be good. I'm also curious what kind of car doesn't have a speedometer. <laughs> a street mechanic thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's totally not made from stolen parts. Um, anyway, so please support Ted. Also, we have vendors who have been nice enough to uh, uh, support us with some giveaway. Uh, uh, so we got Twilio and King and Union. Who's cold today in the snow and the rain? Um, you, sir, you got some socks and a hat from Twilio and King and Union. So congratulations, we will warm you up. Come, come on, yeah, you, can, you can come on up. Okay, yay, throw it. There's a long history of things being broken when we throw stuff at ShmooCon. I will gently hand it to him. And with that, Wendy is going to talk about attorney-client privilege and incident response, which is actually pretty awesome because I've done a fair bit of IR covered by privilege, and it turns out it's really useful. So here's Wendy to talk about that. Cool. Can you guys hear me? All right. Yeah, I love how Bruce sets everybody up with you should be skeptical and snarky, and then he throws an attorney on this stage. So let's have a look at this. Um, so I used to be a software developer, and then, I don't know, I got hit upside the head and decided to go to law school. Um, so I did that, and then I worked at a law firm in D.C. after law school, and I did some of this IR stuff from the legal side. I had done um, some incident things um, as a software developer in a previous life, and I currently am a senior security advisor at Leviathan um, out in Seattle. So I'm an attorney. I am so very much not your attorney. This is not legal advice. Uh, I'm going to be saying talk to your attorney throughout a lot of this um, because so much of it is very specific uh, to people. So uh, this is a tweet from Sarah Jong's really funny uh, live tweeting of Uber versus Waymo. Uh, and one of the little side things in that was that Strauss Freeberg did a report where they did like some forensics of some devices, and there was a big dispute about how much of that report could 
uh, come in as evidence and be used in the case. Um, and I believe in this case it got messed up and like they weren't allowed to. Uh, and I picked this because it kind of shows how really finicky uh, it can be to protect reports and things under privilege. Uh, so we're going to go through. Uh, you learn this stuff in civil procedure in law school, so we're going to do like an entire law school class in like the first five minutes of uh, this talk so you know exactly what we're talking about. So let's hop in. Uh, let's start with what are we protecting and why? Uh, there are incident response reports, we have pen test reports, we have maybe HIPAA assessment reports, like I swear I write reports all day and they're all labeled confidential and it's got really sensitive information in it about uh, companies and their security vulnerabilities and their security postures and how we're evaluating compensating controls and things. Um, and this is all pretty sensitive information. And so why though are we worrying about protecting uh, this stuff? And it's because sometimes when there's a data breach and it gets out in the news or people are notified about it, consumers will file suit um, against the company and they want access to these IR reports or things in order that they can sort of put forward a theory that they might have um, about the liability. So what is the attorney-client privilege? Uh, that is one way that you can protect some of these reports. Um, it turns out that, you know, sometimes when you get into trial and the companies are trying to seek these reports and get at them, it can fail, um, as we saw in Sarah's tweet, but if you set it up correctly, which is what we're going to talk about today, you can often uh, protect these, and we're going to talk about some cases in which they were actually protected. So how are companies getting these reports? It's not like they're hacking into like our SharePoint or O365 and like pulling the reports down from there. You actually end up turning them over as part of a process called discovery. Um, which happens in civil cases um, as part of the civil procedure rules. And these are the rules that govern how civil trials happen. So not criminal law where you're accused of a crime, um, but cases uh, that are disputes between two civil parties. And discovery is really meant to sort of avoid the problem of trial by ambush, wherein you get into um, the courtroom and you think that you have your argument and all of a sudden the other side is pulling these expert witnesses and they're relying on all this stuff that you have never heard about and you don't have time to prepare and to argue against those. And the idea of discovery was, well, we'll let everybody on both sides know what evidence the other side might have and so we can sort of lay out what's going to happen. Um, what happens a lot of times these days with modern litigation is that uh, things are won or lost in discovery fights beforehand. It's a huge deal about what sorts of things are turned over. So we're not going to get too deep into it because it's a really crazy entire other complicated thing, but I just wanted you to be aware. So fun discovery fact. Uh, the information that you are learning through discovery has to be relevant, but it doesn't actually itself have to be admissible in trial. You take an entire evidence class in law school where you learn what sorts of things can be brought into a courtroom, what objections you can make and so forth, and it's also extremely complicated, but discovery is actually fairly broad. It just has to be information that's relevant to the dispute at hand. So, we were talking about pen test reports and stuff. We said, hey, all this stuff is really company confidential. It's very um, important to the company that this stuff not get loose or, you know, loose out on the internet and whatever. And like, how, how are these people accessing this in a trial? And it turns out that confidential information is discoverable if the information would be very damaging to the company to get out, like a pen test report or an IR report where we're having like passwords or other things in it, the court will do something that's called a protective order that they set up so the other side can see the information, but anything in it is not released out to the public. So it sort of masks that confidential information. But some information is not discoverable, and that's the information that's protected by attorney-client privilege. So this protects communications between you and your attorney. And it's really meant to sort of help you have sort of a free and fair share of information with your attorney so that you can get good legal advice. If there are things that you couldn't tell your attorney because you would be worried about them getting disclosed to the other side, then you might not really be able to go and mount your, an effective defense for yourself. So you're probably thinking like, okay, this is great. This is like an invisibility cloak that I can toss over all this information, which is, not quite how it works. So, but wait, we've got a little bit more because it's always a little bit more complicated. There's actually three different things that courts recognize. Attorney-client privilege, the work product doctrine, and the most important one for us, which is the non-testifying expert privilege. So the work product doctrine 
is basically attorneys' notes, like if they go interview someone and they write things down, their work in preparation for court filings and so forth, all of that would be protected. It can occasionally be accessed through discovery, but only in a very rare situation where like the attorney's notes are the only record of the underlying facts, because facts cannot be protected by privilege, only work product and opinions and thoughts and things like that. And the non-testifying consultants thing is often what we're talking about when we're referring to protecting reports that are forensic reports and so forth. This has to be where the consultant is not expected to go be an expert witness in the trial, but rather is like a forensics firm that's hired by the attorney to come help them understand what's happening. And that firm, the technical consultants, are acting as a translator for the attorney so that they can mount an effective defense, so that they understand what was involved, what actually was involved with the vulnerability, why was it not patched, what sort of controls were in place, what was the network architecture here. And they work with the attorneys to explain to them what's going on. So, turns out we don't protect everything. <laughs> if you are committing crimes or so forth, they will basically allow this information to, uh, to be discovered. So please don't go uh, and say like, oh, I'm going to commit this big crime and I'll just CC an attorney and everything, because it doesn't work that way. So cool, we are now experts on protecting information. We just got Discovery 101 in five minutes. And we're going to go into a data breach and sort of walk through um, and talk about how we would be working with attorneys in this way. So one of the things people sometimes say is like, uh, lawyers are not technical at all. Why the heck is an attorney involved with this incident right now? Um, as it turns out, a lot of uh, data breaches have regulatory concerns with them. And attorneys are actually also very good at risk. They're very risk intolerant sometimes, but they do understand it often just about as well as information security people. So the regulatory concerns that we have are things like HIPAA, um, that has very stringent requirements for covered entities notifying individuals when there's like a breach of unsecured health information. Um, and it has all these requirements about notifications and things, and attorneys are often the ones who are experts in what these sort of things are. Uh, there are timelines that gets imposed by things like GDPR. So Article 33 says that you have 72 hours after you become aware of a breach to go notify a supervisory authority. That's not a lot of time. Um, CCPA, which is the California Consumer Privacy Act that was just passed um, and is sort of going to go into effect next year, um, ties in with California's data breach notification law and creates a private right of action. So it becomes much more important there too to sort of you know, dot your I's and cross your T's when you're working on the notification in that state. There are things like New York DFS has requirements about who gets notified and when, and those timelines kind of drive your response. So before you get into the security incident, please create a plan. We go in and talk with companies all the time that do not have an IR plan, they do not have a disaster recovery plan. The time to do it is before you're in an emergency. Um, and at that same point in time, you should consider retaining a, a lawyer who can help you. They can come in and work with you with tabletops, help you create those plans. So your IR plan says these are our regulatory requirements and these are the timelines that we're going to have to follow. You're also going to want to talk about what your communication channels will be. Like, if you have someone in your O365, you don't want to be relying on Outlook email. You want to make sure you have a signal channel or something else set up. And that would be the time if you have a retainer with an attorney to make sure that they understand how to use Signal, that you can sync with them. And it's also very important to look at your insurance policies because a lot of times they have uh, lawyers or uh, forensics firms or whatever that are sort of their preferred partners and they may have requirements that they're going to impose on you if they're going to cover some of this. So Robert is a uh, expert on this sort of stuff. He is also recommending that you engage the firm before you get into an emergency mode um, and do tabletop exercises with them. It sort of warms everybody up, you understand how to work with each other um, and you can sort of sync on how you're going to work with this. So when you're engaging an attorney, it's often really helpful to have an, ex a relation, like an existing relationship with them. But a lot of people go, well, hey, I've got in-house counsel. I don't necessarily need to retain an outside person. <laughs> um, and these people, are, can be great because they can advise you on your business. You may have like product counsel embedded in your development teams and so forth. But this can sometimes be a little bit of a problem in a security incident. 
and it turns out that courts distinguish between business advice and legal advice. So when you have in-house counsel, a lot of times they're giving business advice and they may weave their legal opinions in there. And courts have a, sort of a problem with that sometimes because only legal opinions can be protected by the attorney-client privilege. And so you have to work with them to make sure that it's very clear when they're giving a legal opinion. One way to do this is instead of relying on like the big five-page broiler plate uh, footers in every email, at the top of emails where you're, they're giving a legal opinion, write just privileged and confidential up at the top. If you don't do it in every email, it helps create a stronger signal to the court of this email should be protected. Some other things that you should be doing before you get into a security incident. Please, 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 please set up your logging and your monitoring and know what you're logging. Um, check your time zones. Uh, it's really fun when you have some logs in some time zone and some logs in another. Uh, one of the breaches that I worked on, we had logs in all different time zones and the original report I got from the forensics firm had things like, oh, this happened at um, 9 a.m., this happened at 10 a.m., so I'm gonna put this after. And I'm like, the causality is not there. And I looked at the time zones and I'm like, no, <laughs> like, you're out of order. <laughs> so I basically wrote Python to like reparse the logs to do the timeline and give it back to the attorney. <laughs> Which was really funny because I had no idea how I did it in like 15 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, it's Python. Like, it's easy. Um, your forensics firm should be doing this. I should not be the junior attorney resorting this. <laughs> but if you are consistent with them, it's good. Um, Lee made the point the other day that UTC is better because you don't have the daylight savings time shift. There's, fun fact, I've worked incidents where it's North America and Europe, and it's in the two-week period where the, like, daylight savings. Yeah, yeah, those are fun. <laughs> Um, check your retention also. I worked another incident where they had just moved to HTTPS, which is great. Uh, secure your stuff with TLS. Uh, but they were dropping uh, HTTPS web logs on the floor after 48 hours, but retaining HTTP logs for three months. And we got the incident, we get in, we're like three months of logs. No. That was also fun. <laughs> so again, uh, Jake Williams does a lot of this incident response stuff. Um, and he points out here that visibility is really what we're looking for. We need to figure out what actually happened. Um, how far back does it go, uh, what, is your, what are your retention settings, and so forth. This is where if you're doing a tabletop exercise and you can really uh, get past just a tabletop and get into sort of a live action exercise, you can check what your retention is as you go through it. Um, another thing that the attorney is going to really help you with is figuring out if you have a reportable incident. So we talked about HIPAA, and HIPAA is very important to understand the size of the breach. What information was there? Do we think that the person actually accessed that information and looked at it? Um, there's a lot of factors that go into this, and attorneys are going to be the ones that you're going to want to work with to figure out what are my notification requirements given this uh, event that we have. What they may do then is say, well, we need to engage a forensics firm. And you can have the uh, attorney, especially as an outside counsel, go and engage the forensics firm uh, in there, and this will help increase the protection for that report to sort of give it a greater level of attorney-client privilege because it's going to be under that non-testifying expert protection. You'll want to make sure that the, this says, you know, like, that this investigation is happening at the direction of counsel. It makes sure that the experts are working for the attorneys. The at experts are not, like, working for your IT person. Uh, one thing that uh, the Target case showed was that Target had one investigation where it was like the IT people and internal folks working to sort of figure out what happened with the problem um, and fix it, and then they hired a forensics firm to work with the attorneys to figure out the root cause and what their notification requirements and so forth were, and it was sort of a two-track investigation, and this gave a little bit greater protection to the forensics investigation that happened with the attorneys because they said, well, this one specifically is happening to help the attorneys. It's not just, you know, band-aiding and trying to remediate that's happening over here with the IT staff. When you're crafting the engagement letter with your counsel to hire that forensics firm, it should be very clear that it says it's in anticipation of litigation or potential regulatory action. Um, in the visa case, uh, they were, again, attempting to access a Straws Freeberg report. Um, and basically, the court protected that report because they had been hired by the uh, outside counsel. And the court said only under extraordinary circumstances would they release this report, and that calling the Straws-Friedberg 
uh, team just fact witnesses was highly inappropriate. The team was there working for the attorney. It was very clear in the engagement letter and in the direction um, of the investigations that went through that they were working for the attorneys, with the attorneys, to translate what happened technically so that the attorneys could understand what had happened with it. So then, again, during, uh, you're going to want to activate your IR team, your communications channels, get your PR people going. Uh, they'll be securing some evidence as you go through, and it's very important here to make sure that you work with the attorneys to um, sort of keep track of what you're collecting, tagging this, um, keeping track of it in the way that they understand so that when you get into a regulatory proceeding or if criminal sort of things happen, uh, you've kept track and sort of uh, kept the evidence where it should be. And you should be following the advice of the attorney on engaging with any regulators or law enforcement as you go through this process. Um, again, the attorney is going to be the one who's going to have the most information about, you know, how are we going to gather this evidence? Where do we need to keep it? What's the sort of retention things that we should be worrying about here? And as you're communicating with the attorney about all of this, you want to make sure to maintain the privilege over that information. So the messages to counsel should make it very clear that I am seeking a legal opinion from you. This is in anticipation of potential legal action. Um, what happens a lot of times is in a discovery fight, like all the email will get slooped into a system like Relativity or something. There are these big like electronic uh, parsing uh, discovery tools. And you'll do searches like um, to look for the words legal opinion, look for like seeking your legal advice. And those will j often just get like marked out for like just a quick check to make sure that they should be protected by privilege. Um, and it will not necessarily advance through and go through the next uh, relevant sort of review. So any way you can sort of mark this communication as I am talking to my attorney to seek legal advice sort of helps protect it and hold it back from disclosure to the other side. A joint defense agreement. So these are not just for the president and his uh, co-conspirators or whatever. Um, <laughs> these can be really helpful if you're on like a cloud platform, if you have a business partner you work very close to and you assume you're both going to get sued or both be um, involved in some regulatory thing together. Because usually attorney-client privilege gets destroyed when you tell the information to a third party who's not you and is not your attorney. And a joint defense agreement says, no, no, we have common legal interests and so we're going to work together on this and it allows you to disclose information to that party that you have the agreement with as well. And this can be a really touchy one, monitoring for suspicious activity. Oftentimes we need to go look at what's happening on the network and sort of try to figure out where are the footholds of this malicious party on the network, what systems are they in, before we make one move to kick them all out. We don't want them to keep a foothold in the network. But there can be legal and regulatory concerns with sort of sitting there and monitoring, especially if it's something that is not a computer that you own, which can become kind of important in today's cloud environment and so forth. And this is where it's so fact dependent. You really need to get an attorney engaged and talk through like, this is what we want to do. This is our concern. Help us figure out how to do this in a way that protects us. And there are usually interviews that need to happen as part of this. And one way to really protect the information that comes out in these interviews and protect the notes and so forth about them is having outside counsel do the interview rather than having like a, an internal program manager or IT person do an interview. Have the outside counsel do the interview, take the notes, and then this helps protect it under privilege because it's part of their investigation there. Looping back on logging, please log. <laughs> please make sure you actually have your audit settings set to retain things in um, your attention is going incorrectly. Please pick one time zone because I can do Python to fix it, but it is damned annoying. Um, and a lot of attorneys don't know how to do that, so make, make their lives easier. <laughs> These reports, when you get them, should, from the logs, contain a timeline of the breach, what we think was the cause, supported by things in the logs and not just making bald assertions of like, oh, we think this software was installed, so clearly it had to be this CVE. And I'm like, I want to see it, like, show me something from the log showing that that was what you think happened. Um, and it should be delivered to the attorney, and the attorney should be the one going and asking for edits, uh, clarifications, and so forth, because it's really their product that they're getting. Um, and it sort of makes it clear that this is um, basically working with them in anticipation of any litigation or so forth that might come out. 
So what happens if you get this great report and it's been protected by privilege and it's got all these things in it that you really want to share when you get sued and you're just going to pull chunks out and put it into the court filings and be like, well, you know, we considered this compensating control but we didn't actually implement it because of these great reasons and this other risk thing and so forth. It turns out that you can have protected everything to this point and then destroy the privilege by sharing too much of the report. So this is something that your attorney should work with you on and make sure that um, you're aware that you know, you can share the facts because facts cannot be protected, but you can't like pull like paragraphs out and paste it in um, to a court filing and still preserve privilege. So uh, we're just gonna sort of loop back and summarize some of the most important things for it. And then you guys are totally going to be experts on working with attorneys and in incident response. So before it happens, before the big like chaos emergency, create a plan. Have an attorney that you have a relationship with, who, someone who you can call up and be like, hey, we just had an incident happen. Our security team thinks this is actually pretty serious. Please come help us. Set up your out-of-band communication channels. Log everything, please. <laughs> uh, secure the evidence according to the attorney's directions. Um, make sure that you are framing all your communications with uh, the attorney as seeking legal advice, you know, in anticipation of potential uh, litigation or so forth, and follow the directions of what they're telling you to do. So I collected some sources. I will tweet out this slide deck after this talk. Um, I always like sending people where to go because 20 minutes is not enough time to teach everybody this. It's so not anywhere in the ballpark of enough time. So these are some things that you can go look at to uh, learn a little bit more. Cool. Uh, I I'm not sure if I have any more. T I took my glasses off, so I can't actually see the sign. <laughs> Do I have time for a question? Nope. Okay, find me around afterwards. 